big cold front came out of the north. They got a little angry and made some tornadoes. Unfortunately, one of the communities just on the outside of Ottawa in the valley there got obliterated. It's uh, 52 homes were destroyed. I got stung a few days ago. Face swelled up like that. What was that scene in the movie Hitch? Ready to shoot again. And lo and behold, he gets attacked by his dog. We have got to get this shed done. It seems like since we started this project, everything's been going wrong. I think we're going to increase value in this kitchen. This is not acceptable. And that is money in the bank. This is where it gets fun. Fire in the hole! <sighs> it's not the time to be putting out the big dollars. Thank you, here are we. Here's another tool you won't need to buy. Perfect, every time. In today's episode, we are talking sheds. We're not just talking any sheds, we're talking about building your own. We're not gonna to go to the store and buy a prefab because I don't think you get great value for your money and you have very, very small limitations. And let's face it, they blow away in the wind. So we're gonna build something here, we're gonna pour a pad, we're gonna frame it, we're gonna add all kinds of great little personal touches to it so you can learn how to build your own shed and get everything you want out of your store space. So the most important part of building your custom shed is layout and design. Remember, design world, when we're designing something, it has to function. And it doesn't have to just function for everybody, it has to function just for you. So what you need to consider is, what kind of storage space are you creating? Now let's face it, in today's world, in North America, we are a consumer economy, we got stuff. We got so much stuff, we have garages attached to our house, we don't even put our car in it. We have <laughs> sheds for gardening, and they're so full of stuff, you can't even begin to pot any seeds in there anymore. So we need more space, so the best way to do it is to build yourself a custom shed, get some of the things out of your way like your lawnmower so that you can use your other shed, get some room to store all your tools so you can get your garage back. This is the solution to a lot of your problems. So let's talk about what to do when you're thinking about building a shed. First up, let's talk about the space that you need to build one. It doesn't seem to matter what kind of home you live in, no matter where you are in this country, you're going to need more space. So if you don't have a lot of yard, you might find yourself building like a little addition on the outside of your house and just some simple swing doors, that might be fine. But if you've got property like this and you're gonna have lawn maintenance equipment and you've got a lot of hobbies and that sort of thing, then you need a lot more space. So if you have the room for something rectangular, I like to suggest that. I like to have lots of doors on a storage area because I don't like it when you open the only door and you've got your lawnmower sitting right there in front of you and all you do is pitch things into the corner because you can't get into the room. And that ends up just being a bunch of clutter mess, right? So I like rectangles and we have a building code where we're from where we can go 10 feet by 10 feet by 10 feet high. And we don't need to get a permit for that because it's not a permanent structure. So that's kind of the idea that we're gonna work with today. We're gonna to build it a little more rectangular, 10 by eight. But if you wanna get something longer or more square, or even make yourself a round Mongolian yurt, the secret is you need storage and you've gotta keep it dry. So let's talk about things that are in the backyard that are gonna cause you problems and how to avoid them. Now before we build, we need to plan and there are four things you need to consider before you do that. Drainage, sound, wind, and ugly, all right? You want to do four things with your shed. You want to hide things that are unsightly. You want to protect yourself from wind. If you get too much wind and it's making something difficult to go grow in your garden, or you want privacy issues, or like we have a schoolyard behind us. So behind this property, we're actually going to create this shed to be actually a sound barrier wall as well, which will be brilliant. No more kids screaming and school bells taking up the space in the afternoon. And the other thing you want to deal with is drainage. Now this is crucial because this will affect the integrity of the structure. Almost every house that's built is built with the idea of drainage, where the water is supposed to be running away from the building, collecting in ditches or culverts or something like that. And back here, we are actually at the lowest part of this property, but on the other side of the fence, the drainage continues to go about another 10 or 12 feet, which means even though we're a four season climate and we're gonna get thaw and freeze cycles, we aren't gonna have a buildup of water turning to, to ice here. So when we build our shed, as long as we pour our concrete on top of a stone pad, we're gonna be just fine and we're not gonna experience all that heaving and cracking and breaking and tearing things apart. So this is good to go. So remember, drainage, wind, sound, and ugly. As long as you take care of all of those in consideration of what you're gonna build, you're gonna be just fine. Now what we have here is a really typical kind of pre-built shed, eight by eight by eight. It's got this double pitch roof. <laughs> Let's just see. All right, 
Yep, there's the lawnmower. And there's the and this is all you have access to for space. Typical. And this might not be a problem for you. This might actually be the solution you're looking for. The secret here is this homeowner built it on those little two by two foot concrete slabs on gravel. But when you build it that way, you have to make it dead perfect. Because these kind of prefab kits have no mercy if you don't have them exactly square and level and plumb. So just a word of warning, if you're gonna get a kit like this, which runs a little over 500 bucks, if that's gonna be enough space to solve your problem, you're gonna to wanna to watch step two of our program here to know how to pour a concrete pad because that pad is gonna save you a lot of time and aggravation. It took him almost three days to build this from when I was talking to him. If he had the pad, he could have done it in an afternoon. So just remember, when you're designing your shed or your outdoor building, keep in mind the neighborhood. Look at the lay of the land. Try to imagine what it's gonna look like when it's there. You don't want what you make to be a huge monstrosity. So in our design, we're actually going to do just a single slope roof. And you can see in the background, if you put a big rectangle there with a single slope roof, it's going to fit in right along with the line of that cedar hedge. You're not obstructing your sight line. It's not gonna look like a monstrosity from the other neighbors around the corner. And so you're not gonna get any kickback from your neighbors, right? The other things for design, think about using big barn doors, lots of access. Think about having an, a secondary door around the side where you can bring the lawnmower instead of in the middle, off the corner, all right? Have one set of the walls set aside just for your lawnmower. If you tuck it away and you only have to sweep a couple of feet every once in a while from the grass clippings, it'll keep the rest of your shed nice and clean. I always like to say, put in a couple of simple windows, maybe something that opens up to get some airflow. I always like to pour my pad a little bigger than the building. It gives you some outdoor storage space. Maybe the opportunity for a little sitting area if you have a view that would take in the sunset. It's just a thought. And last but not least, think about some hanging planters or window boxes. Dress it up. Remember, it's a part of the home. It's just a little bit off the side. So if you make it look pretty, it'll actually increase the value of your property. And it's not gonna cost you that much. A little bit of sweat equity, right? But we're gonna show you everything you need to do. Stay tuned with us on the ride. Step one of your project is always preparation. So what we need to do is remove our organics and our stones here out of our way so that we can have a nice compacted gravel base. That's a great way to lift the rock. Sweet. Get this little garden rake. Now look at this. Once you're underneath the roots, Everything comes up real nice and easy. Okay, so we've got rid of our organics, and now we are just trenching the front of the pad. This is at the high side, and it's just a matter of creating a hole. Because we're on a hill, and I'm using these five quarter boards as my framing, I'm gonna stick this in. I wanna be able to drop it in so that my concrete finish is just a little bit above the grass. Set this in, perfect. Now it's just a matter of setting the right height. Right there in my corner. Obviously, I'm way too low here, so I'm just gonna put in a little bit of dirt, and now I can go, and now I see how much I have to raise this up. Wow. Finally. Perfect. Now, just a quick, Note, the longer your level, the more accurate it's gonna read. So now that we have that level, I'm just gonna put up the sideboards, throw one screw on each end, just to keep the joint closed. I'm gonna lift this board now, and I'm going to find out roughly how much I have to build up before I get too crazy. Wow, just a little bit more than that brick standing on end. That'll give you an idea how much buildup we have to have back here. That is actually crazy. That's a little bit too high. Wow. Wow. 
Yeah, that just gets crazy. So you can see, we just finished off figuring out that our level is way up here, almost eight inches off the ground. Uh, that's gonna involve way too much aggregate and way too much work to fill this hole. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to the beginning. We're gonna reset our, our first ridge here, much lower, flush with the grass. Ah. Oh, let's start all over again. So what we've just done is we've decided that because there's so much backfill to go on, after we're done with the pad, we're gonna dig out the first eight, 10 inches of grass around the perimeter and put in some river stone to fill that up. So that way the ground has a natural drainage around our slab. We can accomplish the same thing doing that way. And it'll also help to remove the amount of aggregate and work that's gonna be necessary to fill this hole. Okay, so now we basically have our, our frame all figured out. One last step we have to do with the framing, and that's square it all off and then put in our posts. We wanna add a couple of little, little two by two stakes just around the perimeter to help keep things from flexing underneath the weight of all of the aggregate and cement that we're putting in here. Other than that, we're pretty much good to go. We have some reinforced steel that we're gonna put in as well after we put in our stone. And that is going to be just to provide this slab with some strength because we do have four season weather here. And when the ground freezes, it'll help hold it in one piece and it'll raise and fall together in the winter time. And that'll be really important because basically it, it freezes around the outside first. And as the frost line creeps in, the ground starts to lift and you want your slab to lift together and then settle together. So the reinforcement on anything outside is super, super important. Now, I'm only a quarter inch off. And since it's a slab and it's outside, I think that's about as square as I need to make that today. Yeah, we're just gonna drive them in here. That works. So back here, the ground's a little tough, so I made myself a little Dracula stick. <laughs> that's gonna be awesome. So I'm just gonna backfill this dirt here that we pulled out of the way. Before you know it, it's gonna be time to pour concrete. The cost of the stones, two yard purchase, 36 bucks. It'll be, it'll vary depending on your region, but it's about the same kind of price, right? And it's the delivery that costs the money. But if you were to bring this much stone back in bags from a, a building store, it would cost you maybe four or $500 for the same amount of stone if they package it in plastic for you. So for that kind of money, you can buy yourself a handy dandy wheelbarrow like this with two wheels. And it's so much easier to work with. So I've got about 20 trips of the stone, and then we'll be able to set a rebar. Whoops. Okay, so our, our steel grid here is four by eight feet. <laughs> Made our box 12 feet wide. It's kind of a no brainer. We're gonna put in three. Now the reason I'm putting it primarily to the front is that in this shed, our design is the front couple of feet are gonna be exposed to the elements where the back is all inside the shed. And honestly, if we get a crack in the floor in the back of a shed, it doesn't really matter. But up front, we really wanna do everything we can do to make sure that this stays in one piece. So we've gone out and picked up this little handy dandy homeowner's version of a cement mixer. It's one bag at a time. We're gonna put it through the ringer today and see how well it works. Hopefully it lasts the whole day. <laughs> we are all ready to mix our cement. Now, I call me old fashioned, but I like to bring my work to where I'm working. So we set up our mixer in the pit with our concrete and we're gonna bring the water over here. And we're just gonna fill left to right, front to back. So every couple of feet at a time and we'll screed it. And then we'll move the machine over after we've deleted some bags. And we'll just keep doing that until we work our way out of the pit. Now, I think we're gonna need a lot more concrete than we see here right now, but it's just nice to get started where it's convenient. We 
we're gonna go work with that. Now, we don't need the picture anymore, but we do need a black marker. There we go, that actually shows up from the inside. So now we're gonna give this machine its inaugural run. All right, we'll get this bad boy turned on. We do not have the ability to lock this in place. I think this is gonna be a long day. <laughs> That's not so bad. So you can see we are almost halfway through mixing our concrete. It's been a little over an hour. Um, just wanted to take a minute now and discuss some of the techniques that we're using here. Uh, I figured it was easier for you to see the process and then we could discuss it so it kind of made sense. sense. We are using a 16 foot piece of lumber as our screed board and it basically runs from ridge to ridge and creates a flat surface. And just like when we're doing drywall mud, or any other kind of finishing, we start from rough and push towards finish. Okay? Now this is a lot easier with a second person, like you saw in the other footage, but now he's holding the camera. So, that's the process. Once you get done to a certain point where you don't have holes to fill, you just jump to the other side and then come back with a lot of movement And you can see that's how you get your surface. If you get any potholes or that sort of thing, just take a handful, shove it in and go again, okay? Once we were done our screeding, I was just taking my trowel, and this is actually used for doing tile work. You'll see that when you run it over the surface, it magically makes everything smooth. All right? After about 45 minutes, the concrete sets up, and then you can just take your big shot broom and lightly drag it across the concrete. That puts a texture on the concrete so that it's not slippery in the winter time or when it rains. And generally, it makes all of the little ripples go away. So this isn't quite as old, and you can see when I run that broom, it does an okay job, but it's grabbing chunks of rock and pulling it up out of the cement, and you don't want that. So if that happens to you, pull this out, take your trowel, smooth it off again, give it another 15 or 20 minutes, and come back to the broom, you'll be good to go. <laughs> Call me crazy, but when I'm working out in this kind of heat, I like to wash everything up about once every hour or so. It just makes it a lot easier at the end. Nothing's baked on. Besides, on a day like today, a little bit of spray off the hose never hurts. <laughs> okay. So just let's get a little update on the project here. We underestimated the total slope of the, of the area here. So we're a little bit shy on cement. So we've only got enough bags here to get about another, I would say another four feet. We're gonna be about two feet shy of the load. So Max is gonna run back to the store, load up his truck with cement and hurry back. It's already about four o'clock, super hot today. We're well over 32 degrees. And uh, it's nice to be working with water finally, but I think, I think another two hours we should get this all wrapped up just in time to pass out in the pool. Uh, really looking forward to tomorrow when we can take off the boards and see how it looks. All right, well, let's just get an update for our project here. It is day four, we are on our shed build, and you can see that with the uh, 
contractors have come by and installed a fence for us, which is awesome. I don't have time to do everything myself, so we had that contracted out. Sometimes it's easier when you're dealing with neighbors to uh, remove yourself from the equation, right? So we had the pad taken care of. It's had a couple of days to cure now. So today we are going to start framing and we are going to get all of that structure built. Oh, my assistant and I are out here taking a look at the pad now. Um, just wanted to go over a couple of basic details. This is a 10 by 12 foot slab. It took a full yard, sorry, a full ton of gravel uh, and 60 bags of cement to get this finished. So give you an idea of the kind of volume you're looking at for a three inch pour. Um, you can use that sort of math. You can also go to the stone yard and you can give them the size and square footage and the depth that you're going to work with. And they've got a little calculator on their computer and they can formulate your, your stuff for you. This was actually poured over two days because we were running short. So what we did is we poured this whole section and across the front. And then after it had set for about an hour and a half, we managed to broom that and got a pretty good look. The second day, this was done. So that's why you see the line. It doesn't really matter. We're building a shed and it's going to be seven by 10. So all of the second part of the pour is going to be inside the shed. We're not concerned. Visually, this is still going to be stunning. And uh, just really glad this little machine over here was awesome. We're really pleased because we didn't expect it to make it through the whole process. We thought we'd be mixing the last few bags in the wheelbarrow, but it held up really great. So kudos to that machine. If you're uh, in the market for a cement mixer, these little one bag at a time, they're good little machines. And so if you're wondering about the Dunsworth, uh, the funny story here is Max was actually inspired to do cement work. He was watching a video by an actor who was in the uh, Trailer Park Boys series. He's done a bunch of concrete work at his house. And so Max was like, I gotta get me a cement mixer and I'm gonna do some concrete work. So when the idea came up to put the shed together, Max was like, oh, I'm gonna make this huge pad for my house. And so he bought this machine. And so since it stood up to the test of time, he's nicknamed it the Dunsworth in honor of the actor. So I think that's pretty darn cool. When you're framing on a concrete slab, you need two different kinds of wood. One is you need regular spruce lumber, and the other one is you need pressure treated, okay? And the reason you want pressure treated lumber is because the building code allows for you to use this as your bottom plate in direct contact with concrete so that it won't suck up the moisture through the concrete and into your wall. When you build like this, you actually have a moisture barrier between your concrete and your spruce so that the mold that's naturally occurring in wood cannot grow. This is very important because whether you're outside on a concrete pad like we are, or you're framing in your basement, it's the same science. And if you build like we're gonna show you today, you'll be able to frame anything in your house. So I'm gonna give you an idea of what's gonna happen. Let's say from this post to this post is the side of our shed. And this is about an eight foot tall. We're gonna build it with the wall on the back side of the shed at seven feet and the wall at the front at eight feet. So we have a slope that'll facilitate our removing of the water to the back side of the shed, but it also makes it really easy to build and you only have to build one slope for the roof. This is why I'm gonna show you this technique today because building a shed doesn't have to be a work of art, it has to be functional. And the first rule of design is make sure it functions. There's no need to make all kinds of extra work and all kinds of extra design elements in building a shed with two different slope on the roof. So by doing one slope, we can actually save a lot of money because we don't have gable ends that we have to use extra materials and throw in the garbage. And that'll save you time and money and it'll give you a great look. So we're gonna finish this off with a nice little pressure treated one by five running around the edge of the roof. You aren't gonna see any roofing. It's gonna be sleek, it's gonna be sexy, it's gonna function, it's gonna be cheap, it's gonna be quick. Stay with us. So we've just cut our boards. We've got our layout here. We've got two by fours, pressure treated 10 foot long. And then these ones we've cut back so that our total exterior is seven feet. The reason we're doing that is our design element actually takes into place. Our roof is gonna extend out to the front edge of the slab. We have a couple of posts to pick up the weight. And you also have a sitting area out front as well. And I'm sure the dog will appreciate having a nice cool shaded area to sit all day long. Our elements here are basically simple. We're going to have a door in the middle. We're going to have a window on each side. And we're going to have a cheater door back here that swings open. You can bring the lawnmower in from the back side. The reason we're doing that is because if you can bring the lawnmower in up against an outside wall, you're going to actually save a ton of space. Having to bring your lawnmower in through the main door makes everything dirty all the time. And it keeps you from having a clean shed because you need room from removing it around 
or it's just always in the way. So we're gonna have a little cheat door here. It'd be almost like a hidden door with a little side ramp. We're gonna build that separately. But let's get back to framing. We need to lay out. You need to understand what it is you're gonna build. So the way you lay it out is simple. Basically, it's all about visualization. For us, we don't have a plan we're working off. It's all coming out of here. So we're gonna go with our 10 foot by our seven foot. That is simple. And we are going to just cut our plate, put it in place, get an idea. Am I gonna be happy with that? Is that, is that big enough? Is it small enough? Once you got all those questions done, then you're ready to start. Because this framing here, this plate, this is the first step that you need. Next step you do is you make the same frame for the top of the walls and you just get all those cut and laid out as well. So in our effort to try to keep things really simple, if you have a skill saw, I'm gonna show you a way that you can actually cut all your framing lumber and then you don't need to set up a chop saw. You just take your measurement, put your mark on the wood, get your little square here, or triangle as I call it, because it kind of looks like a triangle. Anyway, on your saw you're gonna have a line where it marks zero, where the blade cuts. And you want to set that up on your pencil mark and then move the triangle right up to the, to the guide, right up to the guard. And I'm going to use this, squeezing it against the frame, to be my cutting guide. So I cut straight through the wood. Now, that gets you a perfectly square cut. Nothing ever binds, nothing's ever on an angle, and everything is always perfect because you're not freehand cutting. So that's a great technique. And if you don't have a chop saw and you want to build a shed or you want to frame your basement, you can use that technique. It only takes a couple seconds to cut. And honestly, it'll save you a few hundred dollars. So you can see how efficient this is, just having the saw right next to your lumber pile. Pull the square up, grab the saw, line it up, squeeze. And the next one. Remember, anytime you're cutting your lumber like this, anything that's less than 15 or 16 inches, keep it in a separate pile. They'll come real handy later when you're building, you're stabilizing for your walls, or you're doing little work on the rafters or the sidewall. This kind of stuff is like gold, so keep it organized. And don't start setting to it ahead of yourself and throwing it all out. So you can see I've got my nine pieces of wood basically laid out in the location that they're gonna go. And all you have to do here is take your top plate, Walk it to the other side, and then start nailing everything together. And like I said, there's two ways to do this. You can screw it, or you can nail it. Here's a little tip for you. When you're working with the screw gun, one of the benefits is if you have a piece of wood that's twisted, you can line up the bottom, okay, screw it in, and then you can use this claw that's on the back of the framing hammer. Now, not every hammer has this, so I like this hammer for this reason. This little claw here actually gives you the ability to grab the wood and twist it and force it into place either direction. Okay. All right, well now that we've got our wall done, we're ready to finish it. <laughs> what we want to do before we go stand it up into place is actually get the outside skin on. Uh, the reason for that is because the board, it's a typical kind of exterior board for sheds. It comes pre-primed. So this is the exterior panel. It's basically designed to look like wood, but it's more of a pressed board. Um, you can take a look at the back there, it's just a chipboard. And the front of it has been manufactured to look like it's all kind of beautiful wood paneling. There's our 48 inch line. That's the middle of that stud. And so what happens is you put the first one on flush at the corner. You can nail all the way up the side of this one and it's tongue and groove. So it's actually, it's more like a shiplap over overlap. So the, other, the next piece will actually go overlap this and come up to this little raised bump 
right to here. And it'll also have a nailing surface on that same stud because we set this middle of the stud at the 48 inch, which is right there. So this is gonna work out perfect. This is why if you understand your building materials and how they're installed, and you just follow the framing technique of keep everything on center, 48, you're gonna be just fine. Now, these sheets are eight feet tall, so it's more than what we need. So we're gonna go cut it off. I'm gonna cut here. When you're thinking about your finished cuts for your exterior wallboard, you need to have your entire design plan figured out. We're gonna go very New England style here. So we're gonna use pieces of one by three trim at the corners of the bottom and the top, just to close everything off, get a nice finished look. So I know I don't have to have my cuts perfect. I just have to have them close and let all the trims do the rest of the work. And we're gonna save that for later, just in case. Well, it's important to note, this is a primer, not a finished paint. It's not gonna have good protection against the UV. It'll just make sure that while you're building and the following couple of weeks after that, it's not gonna get destroyed if you get rain. But it is very important to make sure you paint your finished product. Okay, now you'll notice that these grooves are lined up with my nail heads. So these boards are designed that my, the groove of the board is lined up with everything at 16 inch, 16 inch on center. So I can actually go up and nail the middle of the board in as well, which is perfect. And I know that every second groove is gonna have lumber there. Once you understand that building materials are designed to fit together, it's a lot more like Lego, but you gotta use a hammer. It's not so intimidating, is it? Now, one of the best ways that you can drive the, the head of your nail in, take your screw, put it on the head of that nail, and just drive it like that. Use it like a nail punch. Here's another tool you won't need to buy. Now here's an interesting fact for you. All of the kits that are out there for building sheds, generally you're using the same board material. I think you're gonna find that when you price this out, this particular way of doing things will actually be a little bit, uh, a little bit cheaper than buying the kit. I am gonna teach everybody here a little trick how to lift up your wall by yourself and install your bracing without having it collapse on you. Now watch, you lift, pull that back on the board a bit. When you unscrew, hold it open. Now it's a hinge, okay? Nice and loose. Okay, now everything moves independently. Now watch the hinge part. See, nothing happens there. Okay, I come over holding my wall now. Okay, there we go. That's not going anywhere. Just remember, when you get materials delivered, they're intentionally not getting the best stuff in the pile. So here we go, that's a seven foot high shed on the back wall. Now listen, you don't need to have a six foot wall with an eight foot peak and back to a six foot wall again and make a really short entrance. We're gonna go seven here, eight feet out here. You're gonna have tons of space. You can have storage above your head when you're inside the shed. This is a great design because now every part of this wall is no taller than the height of that panel right out of the factory. This is important because if you make a gable wall with a peak, now you have to make your whole shed really low or you're gonna be buying extra pieces of that exterior board in order to cap the triangular gable on the top. So this is why this design works and it's real quick and simple. Now Max is gonna go grab me some lunch <laughs> and while he's gone, we'll throw it on time lapse and I'll just keep on building and we'll see you when he gets back. There we go. 
And if there's a gap with the front skin and the top, it doesn't matter because we're going to be adding the 1x4 boards everywhere to cover up our gaps and to make it all look pretty. So you have lots of flexibility, which is why this design is perfect for the homeowner. Now, we're going to build the front wall. And the reason we stopped our, our production here to talk to you on camera is because we're going to do a door and two windows. Now, without getting into too much detail, there's a variety of different types of window you can buy for a shed. You can buy them so you have a regular case window and it has a nailing flange on it. And I think if you buy or have seen other videos, there's uh, windows that come with some of the shed kits. It has the nailing flange and it goes over top of this board and then you nail that nailing flange on and it looks ugly. Uh, <laughs> what we're going to do is we're actually getting a window. It's designed, it's called a shed window. It's at Home Depot. It's part of their stock lumber, stock uh, inventory. And it has a, uh, a window, exterior window casing, like a jam. And it sits wider than the window. So when you're looking at them, uh, there's going to be a measurement. It'll say 15 by 39, okay, is one of them. The, it, the 15 measurement is actually the, the width of the exterior of the window. The casement part that's inside that goes between your, your, your studs is actually, um, I, think, I, think it's, uh, I think it's only a 12. So this window, you can cut into any stud bay and you can just, if you're not worried about your design or you're just looking to get a bit of daylight in there, you can just take any stud bay, trace out the 39 inches, cut it with the saw, drop the skin off and then stick that window in all right and throw a couple screws from the inside and you're done and you're good to go freaking paranoid of getting stung by a bee again i got stung a few days ago face swelled up like that what was that scene in the movie hitch remember that yeah that allergic reaction from shellfish or something that happened to me holy crap that was amazing i thought i was gonna die that's where he stung me the damn thing's made a nest right underneath the stairs to my tool shed. So I got back from vacation and I couldn't get any work done because I couldn't get in to get to my tools. I went in there one day and as on the way out, they stung me right in the ankle because something's crawling over the road. And uh, swelled up real bad and I couldn't walk for a couple days. I was like, wow, that's quite a reaction. So then I started shooting this thing with the, with the raid, you know, and all these other compicles. And I thought maybe I had it one day. So I started disassembling the stairs and all the bees came out again, so I lost it and I'm shooting. I got two of them in my hand. I'm going like a maniac, trying to shoot them all out of the sky, you know? Anyway, one of these little buggers, I was stacking, standing 20 feet back from the nest, and it just came out of my blind sight, right across my eye, and sap, knocked me right in the nose. Next thing you know, <laughs> I'm inside, I got ice on, and my face is swelled out like this. Ay, ay, ay. Man, is it ever hot today? I tell you, we sure don't get that dry heat to get down in the south around here. Around here, it's always that kind of heat that just makes you sweat just by opening up your eyes. Oh yeah, yeah. All right, it's over 100 degrees right now. Holy crap! That's almost perfect. Wow. busy day it's a hot day but we got our walls up we're just gonna have to uh, get this squared get it attached to the concrete and then tomorrow we'll worry about the roof because like always looks like it's gonna rain <laughs> okay so the last part of our framing of the shed is actually to square it off and then get it attached to the concrete just remember the reason we build our walls with the plates fully intact even though we have door areas is because after we've attached everything to the ground then we'll cut out the plates. So it makes a bit of noise. Don't be afraid to use your mirror protection here. You want to have to force that screw in there. 
If you're not forcing your screw in, it's not really grabbing. The other option is a little bit more fun for all you gun enthusiasts out there. It's a 22 caliber explosive hammer. I like using the number fours. It's because they make a nice big bang. Put your little bullet in there, all right? And then before you go getting crazy, this one you definitely want to use here in protection. It's loud. Push it twice and go. Then pull the trigger. Woohoo! Well, that was easy. I wonder how loud it is without the ear protection. Oh, that's pretty loud. I think I'm going to wear the ear protection. I love this new trigger. Gotta love my job. Fire in the hole! I love my job. So that was our second day of work this week over a four day period. One day to pour the concrete, a couple of days to let it set up, one day to frame the walls. And as you can see, the progress is coming along just nicely. I think till next time we work, we're gonna get the roof on and then you'll see the whole design start to come together. And then it's just a matter of doors and windows and a few finishing trims. And we're gonna show you also how to waterproof and seal up this kind of a structure so you don't have advanced rot. It's always be a shame when people build an outdoor shed and they don't build it to last. So we're gonna show you all those tips and tricks coming up soon. Welcome back to our reality renovation episode update. We are here on our shed building project, which is taking forever. It's kind of funny because we originally had set aside about two weeks for us to film this, just in case we had weather interruptions. You know, when you're filming something, it usually takes a little longer than if you're just trying to knock it off on a weekend. Now this is a simple program. Honestly, it's about a four day build. And we are here three weeks later. <laughs> we're still trying to get something done. We were plagued. I got stung with that hornet right in this the side of my nose here and it swelled up my face, something horrible. Turns out I'm allergic to those stings. It's good to know when you're 47 years old. Uh, and as soon as I recovered, Max was on holidays. So we couldn't film. Max comes back from holidays. We got everything set aside. We've opened up our schedule, we're ready to shoot again. And lo and behold, he gets attacked by his dog. Now, it's kind of a sad story because the dog is suffering from some sort of a brain tumor. It's putting pressure on a part of his brain that made him aggressive. And after the attack was over, the dog felt horrible. You know what it's like, right? Anyway, unfortunately, this is the result. They had to put the dog down. <sighs> End of the day, you don't want the dog attacking mom or grandma, right? And if he's in that kind of a situation, God only knows what kind of pain the animal is in. So it's just the most humane thing to do is to put an end to that whole situation. Anyway, Max is recovering. He has himself a few holes in his arm, some stitches and bandages, and we're gonna take it nice and easy today just so that he doesn't aggravate anything. But we gotta get this project done before the winter comes. So we're gonna get on it, all right? So let's get busy. Today we're gonna cover how to do install the roof, and we're gonna try over the next couple of days to finish this project off. And hopefully the weather agrees. Here's hoping. All right, here we go. Now, because we're gonna finish off all of our shed with trim boards, we're not concerned if, if the, uh, the board isn't quite as high as the two by four. And so I'm just gonna trace the top of that board, get this out of my way, activate our safety squint, and off we go. So now we have the slope of our roof all figured out. Not gonna be a concern. Just to take note, when you're building your structure and you're going with a roof like this, it's gonna carry a little bit of load if you have winter time. So we're actually putting our, our joists here every 10, uh, 10 to 12 inches on center, okay? I think here we'll go with 12, it should be plenty. Over eight foot, it should pick up enough load, it won't be an issue. If you find it a little bit soft, all you have to do when you're done is add one more board underneath and screw it to all the joists so that no matter where you step, you're transferring the load to the entire structure. So the best way to design a roof is that all of the ends of the roof are perpendicular to the ground. Aesthetically, it's pleasing. It looks really nice, but now you're dealing with tricky angles. So if you don't have the kind of uh, chop saw and the special equipment to measure and transfer all those angles, that's okay. I'm gonna show you a simple little trick that you can get your angles perfect, and all you need is a skill saw. And what we want to do here is we just want to measure from the ground to the top of our plate on both sides. It's 84 and a quarter. This one is 
96 and a half. We're gonna just write that down on a scrap piece real quick before we forget. Corner, 96 and a half. Now we're gonna take that, we're gonna do the math on it, okay? 84 and a quarter off of that. So that leaves me with a quarter and that leaves 80. <laughs> I have 12 and a quarter difference in height. I'm gonna take that information and I'm gonna show you my trick. So I'm gonna just show you real quick some basics of grade eight math. If you can remember all of this, you're gonna be awesome. If this is square, remember, every, put the little square in the corners, all right? That means this angle is the same as this one. Now, if I go like this and I draw this line, which is gonna be my roof, okay? And I count that as zero, since this is square, that's zero. The distance from here to here, if I translate it here, okay, I draw that line. Now, this angle is exactly the same as this angle. Simple, right? Because it's like a parallelogram. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that difference that we have. We measured out of 12 and a quarter. And I am going to put this mark here, 12 and a quarter. Okay, so now I've got my nail there. And I'm gonna put, and the only reason this works is because we started level. Remember we installed our pad level. So I can actually put this two by four on the corner back there. Oh, if it's curved the right way. And there's my angle. Now that that's established my angle, I'm going to just trace this onto my wood, holding the markers flat against the board. Okay, now there's my angle. Now what I have to do is I have to cut this so that I can invert it. I put that angle on my two by fours. No one's gonna see that from my house. Here we go. So now I have my angle. I'm gonna take this and flip it over and put it to the top corner of all my two by fours, measure, mark it, and cut it. And then I'm gonna have my entire rafter package cut to exactly the same degree before I put it up. So what I'm doing is I'm building a box of six pieces of wood with the intention of lifting this box off, transporting it over here, and then putting it up on the roof. If you're stuck doing this on your own, yes, you can do this on your own. So I can actually run stuff up. I can push that wall all the way up, and then it should be able to lever into position. All right? This is the system. I'm gonna lift this up, and then let go, and it'll fall inside the box. All right, now, the way I'm gonna do this so that it doesn't just collapse and fall apart, because I wanna have something that'll carry the weight as it collapses so I can then slide it to the back, is I'm gonna use this two by four. Now, this is a little note. I am 5'10 and a bit. A healthy bit, I like to call myself 5'11", but if you're a little short and using this actual dimensions, you can't quite reach that, or you don't have this long bit, buy one of these. This is awesome. This is an extender. It's designed for the quick lock system on these bits and on the drills. Okay, pop, done. Now I got myself a two foot drill bit. I could have the mini me version screw this in. Brilliant. Now, I intentionally set these two rafters close together so I could kind of somewhat hold the weight in a convenient location. It's gonna to wanna to run away on me a little bit. We get in the middle, which is what this board is. This represents my middle. I'm just gonna slide this up. And then, ah! It just, yeah, I feel like if I'm letting go, it's gonna fall. So, I'm gonna be a little bit taller here. Control that drop. Okay. Now it's time to get rid of this temporary support. Just slide this back out of the way now. All right. Whew. All right. All right. 
One of the benefits of building everything square from the very beginning is if it's square on the bottom and the corners are tight and it's all screwed together, it's square at the top. So when you're doing your squaring of the roof, you don't have to pull it out the square and do the three, four, five, six rule. Just line up everything to be the same depth off the top of the wall and you know it's gonna be square. Time to add the rest of the rafters. Okay. You know what Red Green used to say, if they don't find you handsome, they better find you handy. That's the Canadian way. <laughs> There we go. Support done. So before we put our sheathing on, realize that this is the edge of my roof and I'm adding this board flush to the outside of this rim and extend it up. So when I slide my sheathing down, it's nice and tight and you'll see it'll just come right here and that'll be where it stops. And then all I have to do is square it off on the outside corner and I can nail it in place. Problem solved, one man job. Now, there's an easy way and a hard way to do this. The hard way is to walk up while you're carrying it. Easy way, stand in the middle, put your plywood on the ladder, put a nice wide grip, and just lay on the ladder. Keep your center of gravity nice and low. All right, now we just stand on our ladder and Slide it in. Now, I'm gonna be using these two and a half inch spiral nails. Five eighths plywood, you're probably fine with a two inch, but there's such a small nail, just doesn't seem to me to have enough girth to it to hold things together in a strong wind, so. Now, it's okay to just put a few nails in to get started. Don't nail right near the tongue, because the next piece of plywood will fit over top of this joint, and doesn't always fit perfectly. This is a perfect example. We're dealing with wood. So this wood is gonna be moving around, right? Yeah, one of the advantages or disadvantages that we're working with here is that uh, this product has been out in the rain for, I don't know, almost two weeks, Maxie? Eh? I mean, I had my bee sting, you got your, had your dog attack, we've had rain, rain, rain. <laughs> okay, I've got this corner in there nice where I want it. So I'm going to nail that in position. Then I can fight with this side. Doesn't have to be perfect. I think that's probably as close as it's going to get, eh? The reason this is a great DIY project is because this design doesn't require perfection, it just requires you to get close. And the way you get this up there is like the caber toss. This roof is just as strong whether these joints are fit really tight or not because they're 12 inch on center. So don't let it get too much of a concern for you. 
if you find that you don't have enough uh, meat in the two by four on the joint, or it's just a little off center, feel free to take another piece, come in from underneath, nail them all together, and then nail the top down. That's another great way to make sure that everything's got lots of contact and is structurally sound. So I know that this is not a traditional installation of a roofing system. I know a lot of guys, they just use a 16 inch span. They're using little roofing clips on the sides. I like to install this this way because it's a lot like a subfloor system. And I think the average homeowner will be able, capable of doing that without any difficulty and without risking life and limb up on a roof. So this works really well. And as long as you're on plywood, you know you're not gonna fall through the roof. So if you have any comments about the roofing system we use to set the deck up, by all means throw them in there. I'm happy to have a discussion. And if you've got an easier system that people can use, then let us know. We are all about getting smarter on this channel. So I'm still learning and I'd be happy to share your tips and tricks and help everybody grow. So now we're on the roof, ready to put our roofing system in, which is incredibly simple because we only have one slope. And when you're dealing with a shed, the goal is to keep the water out of the structure. So when we have an overhang on all four sides, we don't have to worry about if the edge of the roof is sealed up really incredibly watertight. Now it's nice to have it tight so that you don't have water in there and it freezes and pulls things apart. But the reality of it is, if it's not a waterproof roof on the edges, you're fine as long as the main body of this roof deflects all the water off the backside. So remember, your water, your roof system is not a waterproofing system. It's a water deflection system. It diverts water from one place to another. That's all it does. So in freezing environments, water always finds a way to move around and a little bit of moisture in a shed is never gonna cause you any major issues. And it started at the other edge and now I'm gonna go flush here keep everything snug up against the edge. Whew, now that that's done, it's time to put down our membrane. So the system here is relatively simple. We're gonna just slide it over to the edge. And visually, we're looking for about uh, enough that can go over the edge and then just past the, the two by four of the side. So feel free to be a little liberal. This stuff comes in a roll. The roll that you buy is uh, gonna do probably two sheds this size. So don't be too concerned about if you're gonna have enough material. And then we're just gonna unroll it. We're gonna fold it back. Be sure to be standing on the membrane while you're doing this. And then slowly, Pull that back into place, all the way along. Now, just kind of poke it like this. Get the, get, the, get the membrane stretched out, all right? And then you can just use your foot to slide up into place. Simple shed roofing 101. All right, next roll, same thing. We're going to overlap like a shingle. So sticky. And then just seal the toe to make a good seal. That's it. It's like river dance. our fascia metal and we're going to use this to close up underneath our drip edge. There we go. That's pretty easy, eh? That's metal working 101. <laughs> now you've got a completed water diversion system. Right? All right, well, it's been a long, busy, hot day. My God, we somehow find the hottest days of the year to work in. We've got about another hour left to finish trimming up our roof and we're done our roofing system. And all that's left after that is the bells and whistles. We're talking doors and windows, so stay tuned for that. We're gonna have a lot of fun. 
All right, so quick update on the project. Today is door and window day, and that is great news that we have an overhang on our roof because the weather is a little unsettled. So it's not gonna hold us up, which is great. So today, because we changed our door, is modification day. We have to modify our structure, move some studs, reframe a little bit. We'll get all that out of the way, and then we'll be able to get our doors and windows in, and hopefully we don't get too much rain. Well, the weather has turned a little bit lousy, which is awesome because we have got a door that we got to get stained and I hate to waste good sunny day inside taking care of stuff like that. So finally, it's going to start raining. So we're going to get to work on our door. Now, originally we thought about using a door with a sliding hardware system, the barn door style, which is great design wise, but practically it just didn't really measure up. There's a lot of discussion about the region where we live here. It's close to the water. There's lots of critters around. So we decided to go with a door that's going to be hinged so that we can have a really good seal and a lot more confidence. So we're going to have a little bit of fun with this door. We're not going to go with something traditional like steel or fiberglass. We're going to go with a solid wood door. Now, just a note, be really careful if you like this style and you want to go buy one. There are a lot of wood doors on the market that are not solid wood. They're just wood laminate, all right? And that means that there's a face of it that's glued to some sort of substructure. So it looks like a solid wood door, but it's not. So you really want to read the instructions and the details on the side of your package. Because if you buy a laminate door and you put it outside like we are, it's not going to last more than six or eight weeks before it starts to peel apart just from humidity on a bad weather day. So since the weather is the way it is, we've got the rest of the afternoon to get this thing all stained up and get a finish coat put on it. <laughs> This is a rub on, let sit for two to five minutes, and then a wipe off. All right, so our door is completely stained, all six sides. There we go. Now that is perfect. Make sure that the grain of the way your brush is going is following all those wood joints. That'll give you a really nice finish. Take your brush after you've dipped it, paint an area until you think the brush is relatively dry, then come back and do the sides. The other thing we have today is a couple of simple shed windows. Bum, ba, ba, bum. All right, there we go. Now we have the height of our windows established. All right, now I got my safety gear on. Time to get some work done. Wait a minute, I can't see a damn thing with all this safety gear on. All right, just having a little fun. Man, we get enough safety trolls in the comments. I tell you, what is this world coming to? There, that's a hole. It's a little violent. But it worked! I don't care what people say on the internet. There's nothing that's not safe about this. Window number two. Windows are done. So the main door, as we all know, we changed our design to go from a barn door, which, you know, sounded sexy in the beginning, but let's face it, uh, the more we thought about it, the more we realized it's not, not very functional in high winds and wintertime with animals, with everything. It's just, it's not going to work. So it's just the wrong choice for the shed. We're going to cut these loose and we're going to install this stud so that this edge here is in line with that. And then I'll put in a new pressure treated two by four. That'll double it up. We'll reverse the, the natural bow in the wood so it stays nice and straight. And then we'll be able to install our door directly to that. Once we're done that, we'll cut out the plate and we'll start hinging our door. So hopefully this goes really simple. Here we go. 
use this nail here as a wedge so I can open up a consistent gap across this. Now this little tool here is awesome. I use this when I'm installing door handles so that you don't burn them, burn the side of the handle. You know how it gets, eh? Those brush metal handles. You get your drill bit on there, it always rubs up. Let's also make sure that the bit doesn't fall off a screw. Woohoo! Nice. So because we have materials that expand and contract, we can install this door stop here. And that way you don't see the door when it's closed. The gap. There we go. Now I'll close the door. And what'll happen here is if it's out of alignment, just closing that door will straighten everything out. Okay. Now wherever it's laying is where I'll throw my screws. So we have two kinds of hardware here. One is gonna be the latch, okay? And the idea here is it sits there and, and, and the door will latch into it. And this will keep the door from opening by itself, okay? This is like wind control. And this is so you got something to open it with. So we're gonna set this up based on these panels, you know, above this area. And we'll set the latch off the middle of the door here. The danger here is a lot of times these screws are made with softer metal. So pre-drilling might not be a bad option if you don't have a great little gizmo like this. All right. Start the hole with a nail in the direction that you want the screw to be driven. Okay, on an angle towards the middle. Now this handle comes with nut and bolt assembly for going on like fence boards. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna buy a few screws that are hopefully already black. If not, we'll put them in some cardboard and spray paint them. But we're gonna mount this one here and the same one on the other door Wonderful thing about this latch, it's uh, security. Because it has this little padlock thing here, all right, if you want to change out these little Phillips screws with some really long screws, um, you could, okay? And then you can put a padlock on here. The, I don't know, what else to say? It's a door. I think it's pretty. I think it works. Yep, definitely works. There you go, an all season outdoor shed door. Gotta love it. Well, as you can see, our shed is starting to look like a shed. It's uh, pretty much put together. We got it all closed up for the elements, but now it's time to put all the design elements together. Now it's time for us to pimp out our shed. We've got a lot of design elements we want to finish on this thing. So, <laughs> you know, it looks like summer's pretty much over around here now. So let's hurry up and get this done so we can get everything back inside. Well, as you can see, the shed is taking shape. It is starting to look like a shed. Um, we have things that have to get done though. First, we have to finish doing a little trencing around this building. We're gonna add river stone. So we create kind of like a, a moat around our structure here where water can come down the hill and be diverted around the structure instead of flowing through it. We also wanna put in a couple of support posts. We gotta do some soffit work so we can keep the birds out. And we've also gotta finish up all of our trimming elements. Now remember, we're going to go very New England style finish here. Bam, we have to get it all polyurethane caulking ceiling. We got to get it painted. We got shelves to put in. We got a cheater door for the lawnmower. We got a ramp to install. Whew, man, we got a full day ahead of us. So stay with us. We're going to show you how to do all of these elements so that you can have the most amazing shed in the neighborhood. Okay, so the plan here is really not too difficult, but it's pretty particular too. So stay, bear with us here. We're going to cut the plate out. We're gonna add a couple of pressure treated two by fours at the same depth as this door here. And then we're gonna make a two by four door with a finished panel on it. And the idea behind it is this. Remember our panel has an overlay. So we wanna make a door that has the overlay. So when the door closes, the overlay closes over the other panel. <laughs> That's a little specific, but it'll look like a hidden door. And I think that'll be a really cool feature. So we are going to just prep this area and then we're gonna build our frame, and then we're gonna, man, we are gonna see if we can get that just perfect. <sighs> Fingers crossed.
it's just a matter of cutting this, nailing to a frame, throwing our hinges, we got a door. So before we attach to the door frame, we'll check and see how our measurements line up. Pretty darn flush here. I'm using more nails than usual here because I'm not just attaching the skin, I'm using the skin as my structural support to keep the door from twisting over time. So because we're using the same hinge system on the side door, and you can see both at the same time, it's important visually to make sure the hinges are at the same height on each door. So we will cut a couple more cross pieces here. Perfect. We need one more. That is why you keep your scraps around. Perfect. Here's the trick. We have a little bit of room at the top, and the weight of that door is sitting on the plywood right now to create our airspace. So we're going to use our hammer. Just give it a bit of a raise to get it off, get the weight off the wood. Here we go. And this one should be just like the other one. All right. Okay, so the weather report doesn't look all that great. So <laughs> while we got the ability to work, we're gonna get it done. We're gonna finish all the trimming on the shed, which is basically taking our five quarter boards and ripping like we said at two and a quarter and three and a quarter, all right? So that when we come to our outside corners, we will have a finished three and a quarter face here. And then this one inch thick plus this two and a quarter gives us the same dimension on both sides of the corner. Just helps tie everything together real nice of course, we'll use the two and a quarter across the top and then the nice thick base across the bottom. Trim everything up and then we can get our polyurethane caulking out, seal it all up. So hopefully in a couple days when the rain stops, we can get this thing all painted up. Just setting up my table saw. If you're working by yourself, this system actually is more efficient than using a table saw because the boards that you're going to have are never straight. So having a fixed fence causes the boards to get cut different dimensions. When I rip it this way, I'm actually cutting exactly two and a quarter the entire length of the board. And because it gets skinnier, it's easier to straighten as you install. So I just put one screw together in the joint in the corner, attach it to the building. First we'll screw the boards together, then we'll screw it to the building. Now you can see we're getting superior weather protection here. We're also going to be using a, a polyurethane caulking here to connect these two joints and it's very flexible, it's good for four season. And it'll keep this stuff nice and dry. Now when we were we were at the store the other day, we were looking at their kits. We didn't see any of the kits that had any of the protection like that. So I don't know what they're using or if they're using a system, but uh, this is the way to finish it off. Now we're gonna finish this off with a quick light sand and a paint job as well. I mean, the possibilities are endless for what you want it to look like. Turn it in so it doesn't split. So forever, please. I mean, let's face it. After seeing all this, you realize if you can build a shed, you can build a house. Oh, loving it. That's for you, Anthony. This is the best part because this is our door. And the way we're gonna do our door system is we are going to have base trim from the door overhang, and we're gonna have it join 
on that 45 degree angle right here. Okay, so we'll cut that through, attach this to the door, and then over here, at this point, we'll cut that off. We'll also put a 45 here, and then the end piece of a 45 there. So it'll open to complete 90. Don't put your knee in the green goop. <laughs> Top on, the outside corners. The next thing for us to do is get some exterior sealant. And the idea here is you want to bridge the gap from the wallboard to your trim piece. Filling every one of these holes, nice and easy on the pressure. You want to have enough coming out that you're pushing it into the corner. I'm at about a five degree angle here. And I get a nice healthy bead so that it has the ability to expand in hotter weather. Because today, it's not as hot. And you want to just continue all the way to the other side without stopping. <laughs> that one, not too bad. <laughs> the best advice I have when working with polyurethane, if you're not happy with something, let it dry, and then take a knife and cut it off afterwards. If you get a big blob or a ridge, it's easy to remove with a knife later. Try to wipe it out now. You're just going to get it all over yourself and all over your work. It's going to look like junk. Now the reason we want to seal all this up is because this is our water diversion system. Okay? We don't want water getting in behind our trims. We're going to use this to protect all of our boards. Everything inside that shed. All right? The same system you also want to use on your windows. And feel free to get on a ladder and go across the top of all of these as well. This way, even when there's a driving wind, you're not going to get problems in behind all of your trim. If you don't want to use a sealant, that's fine. Then use it all pressure treated lumber inside your, your shed. But this will also help the exterior paneling here last a lot longer. Because when you caulk this first and then you paint, you're overlapping the paint on a seal and that protects that caulking from the UV rays. And that'll make this last 40, 50 years without even caulking again. Oh man, what a perk there. <laughs> no, back on. No, I can't back on. Ah! Oh my God. <laughs> Well, it has been a very interesting last 24 hours, I'll tell you. We got, uh, we got the leftover from the hurricane that came through the Carolinas, and it showed up uh, yesterday at the same time a big cold front came out of the north. And when they met, they got a little angry and made some tornadoes. So I guess before we go any further, thanks for everybody who are in the comment section of our last video from last night. They're releasing uh, your concerns. Uh, we're all good. Uh, unfortunately, one of the communities just on the outside of Ottawa in the valley there got obliterated. It's uh, 52 homes were destroyed. Uh, the tornado jumped the Ottawa River and ended up on the other side in a village called Gatineau. It did some pretty good damage over there too. And we got a quarter million people out here without hydro. Uh, Max is lucky. This side of town, uh, Ottawa's along a river, so on the right side of Ottawa, we've still got power. I live south of town, so we have power. But everybody else in my family, uh, they're in the dark and making their way over to my house to camp out. Uh, <laughs> but listen, we are here because we have got to get this shed done. It seems like since we started this project, everything's been going wrong. Uh, we got to get the last screw into this thing and get out of here before anything else happens. Wow. Uh, the good news is, is we were building this thing for folks all over in different climates. And we wanted to make this structure really strong that took really good winds and was able to withstand it all. And, and so sure enough, here we go. We got a good test, right? We got 100 kilometer hour winds sustained over about four hours. Um, I heard the weather report and I raced over here. 
I was on another site and I was like, Max, we were going to film putting the hurricane ties in, but I, I can't wait. I've got to get this done now or it might not be there in the morning. So I'm glad I came by and did that. The, everything is fine. The, they didn't move a muscle, didn't budge an inch. Uh, it's like as if a storm never happened. So anybody who's concerned about the, the ability for this thing to withstand, uh, you know, intense storms, uh, it's, it's been proven. The wind is still whipping around here in a few different directions. I don't even know where it's coming from right now. It's just a very unsettled day. So we're going to work in some wind today. It's awfully chilly. The cold front is still on us. So uh, it's only 10 degrees right now. Um, we're going to just get this thing done because like I said, we want to get it done. This has been a lot of fun. We're enjoying doing it, but we're just going to feel a whole lot better having this one behind us. Very excited about getting this project done, as you know. Um, let's take a look, because what we did, you know how we had this little trench dug out here? We just filled it up with some rock, a little landscape cloth. It's a nice way to bridge the gap, and it gives us great drainage. So now the water coming down the hill hits the rock, it's gone. It's going to disappear, go around our shed instead of through it, which is awesome. We have our cedar and our soffit products here. So we are going to put up our posts and put up our roof system underneath to close it all up. That'll keep all of the birds and animals out. Then we've got a few more things to do inside. Some hurricane ties. We're going to show you how to install those. Those are simple and they work. And we've got a few other surprises and tricks up our sleeve. So let's get at it. So we're going to install our hurricane ties today. And this basically attaches the roofing system to the wall panel. Remember the rule. When you've got a fastener, Every hole in that fastener is designed to have a screw in it. We just got to drill a hole through the frame so we can attach this piece of nylon string. And then if you ever do get locked in here when the wind blows, you can just open the latch and get it. Now because we're drilling such a deep hole, I don't want to have a huge hole on the other side. And I want it to be on an angle so that water will actually drain out. I don't want water sitting in the hole. So I'm going to do this so that I can get my bit buried in there and come out the other side. This is just temporary. We're going to go to the store and buy some nylon string. So we've got our beautiful 4x4x10 four by four by foot cedar posts. They're a little bit too long. We're going to go right from the concrete pad into a metal block right into the roof. So here we are. Now these cedar posts, they don't have to go up to the sheathing, just into the frame. And I'm just gonna throw in one screw for now so that the wind doesn't blow it around on me. drill. We're going to use our structural screw coming through here to the outside plate through that 2x4 and into this about three inches in. So we're pretty confident that that's going to hold but the strength of the screw is in the thread. So the way you double the strength of a screw is by blocking from here to the next piece. So that's all we're gonna do in here. Add some blocking and you'll notice I got a new tape measure for all of our friends who are on the metric system. <laughs> so this is six and an eighth or 155 millimeters. Huh? <laughs> how does that turn out? Ah, nuts, 154 and a half millimeters. <laughs> and there we go. After I'm buried in the wood, I'm going to be coming out the other side, which is why it's nice to have it up above the soffit. So what we're going to do is we're going to just drive this bad boy in here. We're going to bury it until the head is completely in the wood and it's nice and flush because we have plans to paint all of this trim. Once we're done that, we're going to have a nice compression between here and the posts and this never going to move. Nice, I'm 
going like a tiger. How to install soffit, take one. On something this square, it's not that tricky, right? Because we have a 10 foot shed. Look at this, 10 foot product. <laughs> I mean, it's about as easy as it gets, right? 32. I would suggest getting a nice pair of snips like those Weiss. They're awesome. They're making nice long straight cuts without curling all the metal up. So we gotta get up, then we gotta get over. So every 16 inches or so makes everything look very pretty and intentional. Now for those of you who are not inclined to use nails in this situation, just go ahead and use the solid screws. Roar. <laughs> Let's do the next sheet. <laughs> Almost inevitably, once you fold it one way, when you fold it back, it just breaks off. <laughs> we screw through all three pieces of metal at the same time here. Lock that in place. <laughs> And we're gonna put a couple of these in here and hang some pretty little plants. Whoa, whoa, whoa! That's a lot of spider. Big spider. What do they say? If you build it, they will come. Huh? <laughs> Dude, he is totally owning this spot. <laughs> Who needs a gym when you got a job like this? Welcome to my tiny house tour. And that's it. Guess we should have put in a kitchen and a bathroom. <laughs> Let's see how she works. Ah, how nice is that? Well, we are just about there. We have got just a couple finishing touches regarding trim paint and sealing it up. Don't forget the last process here after it's all painted is to take our polyurethane caulking and seal the base to the concrete. That is gonna keep all the water out forever and ever and ever, amen. So, we are going to take, uh, take advantage of this beautiful weather and we're gonna get all of our paintwork done and then when we come back, you're gonna see all the before and after shots, so don't leave yet. Good plan, well executed on a fabulous foundation, and you cannot go wrong. Remember, no matter what you're doing, if you start on a good foundation, you can fix and adjust and tweak and manipulate and get it exactly the way you like it. Shed building is not difficult, it's just a labor of love and maybe a little blood, sweat, and tears. And remember, if you don't have a good foundation, you might end up something like this in about eight years, which is how old that one is. So remember, right from the very beginning, right location, good drainage, Make sure you've got a solid foundation and you too can have a fabulous little tiny house in the backyard for your lawnmower. And remember, if you're new to our channel and you have yet to subscribe to it, then by all means, hit the subscribe button. We'd love to have you join us for the ride. We've got new videos every single week to help you renovate your home and get professional results. We will see you again next weekend. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of Reality Renovision. If you're new to our channel, then I suggest you subscribe to the channel over here. Don't forget to hit the bell icon for notifications so you'll be told every time a new video comes up. And if you'd like, you can click the link right here and you can binge watch all the episodes that we have on our playlist. Amazing information, everything DIY and decor and renovation and remodeling. Thanks for joining us.